Hello and welcome to this presentation titled Social Inequalities, Health and Well-being among Dalit Women Agricultural Laborers Using the Lens of Dignity and Embodiment Before I begin, I would like to thank the organizers, the entire Equilox team at the Achyuta Menon Center and especially Professor Sundari Ravindran for giving me this opportunity to share my ongoing research. Dr. Tanya Seshadri and Dr. Malu Mohan for all their help and support. I also want to specially express my thanks to my research guide, Professor Rama Baru at the Center of Social Medicine and Community Health, JMU. And finally, my deepest gratitude to the Jagrata Mahila Sangatne in Raichur, Karnataka, where I had worked and then gone back as a researcher of public health. Words will never be sufficient to express my gratitude to the women and karyakartas of JMS. To begin with the introduction in the next slide, the core question around which the research inquiry is located concerns structures of inequality and their reflection in the health of a marginalized community. Caste, class and gender work in an interwoven way and not an additive way. This has been the perspective guiding my inquiry and my questions have centered around how dignity is constructed in the lives of Dalit women and how social realities are embodied or mapped onto the body-mind. This work has been located in villages of Raichur district, Karnataka, and for today's presentation, I will rely largely on my MPhil research and also I draw a little bit from the ongoing PhD. At the outset, I would like to say that while this webinar focuses on this specific case study, I'm hoping that this presentation will lead to questions and ideas about the challenges facing health equity research and public health as a discipline. Um, I would submit that there is a greater need for studies within health equity research that address structural and historical aspects of health and well-being. There is a need for qualitative research on such themes uh, as dignity, humiliation, discrimination, using ethnographic methods and uh, giving primacy to people's perceptions. Uh, in the next slide, I share the motivation that led to the research. Public health as a discipline, in my opinion, has not adequately addressed the issue of caste. While class and gender as determinants of ill health have been studied, caste has been comparatively neglected. Yes, in sociology, there is a rich body of work looking at caste, but not within public health as a discipline. Um, within public health, we see that caste is ad addressed often in statistical terms to look at disparities and comparisons. For example, comparisons of the infant mortality rate, the under five mortality, uh, undernutrition levels. These data comparisons are essential and I completely endorse greater focus of macro data looking at caste and health. Uh, but parallelly, studies that look at the experience of caste in, rel in relation to health are also important. In the next two slides, I share some of the research questions that my study engaged with. Um, the study will uh, looked at the articulation and striving for dignity in the lives of Dalit women. What did dignity mean to um, Dalit women agricultural laborers and to try and locate this articulation in a social and historical understanding of the context and to trace their experiences uh, of dignity in different spheres of life, including interactions with public health institutions. Next, please. It is important to also ask the question, what has been the impact of caste-based deprivation, discrimination and inequality on the health of Dalit communities? Um, Raichur, the location of my research, we have a context where Dalit communities have seen histories of denial, poverty, deprivation, extreme hard labor under exploitative conditions, humiliation, and histories of chronic hunger coupled with chronic drought conditions of Raichur. All these have impacted in myriad ways the health and well-being of people and need to be understood. The community has seen a high burden of both communicable and of late uh, non-communicable diseases. Undernutrition and malnutrition have been major challenges and access to health services, drinking water and sanitation are also major issues. So the conviction that guides the research is that structural and experiential aspects of caste-based 
uh, discrimination and denial of dignity have to be recorded and accounted for historically and must be explicitly made a part of public health discourse. This will lead to addressing the why and how behind the disparities in health variables and status. In the next set of slides, I present the conceptual and methodological ideas. Um, we started the research trying to engage with the theme uh, of discrimination and people's experiences in public health institutions. However, after reading and discussions, we decided to expand the conceptualization to understand the striving for and meaning of dignity in people's lives. A broad public health paradigm that sees health as socially produced requires that we understand how structures of stratification actually operate in people's lives and their linkage to health. Dignity as a concept we felt could provide that lens uh, towards this understanding. It could cover conceptually both material and social deprivation or as David Moss's work suggests, uh, it could uh, look at a denial of both resources and recognition. Public health in its broader sense is about social justice itself and the common theme that linked dignity to public health is interrelationships. Public health is about relations of inequality, hierarchy, power um, and at the core of dignity is also relationships to oneself, to a collective, to society and the state. Gopal Guru writes that dignity is about a person feeling valuable in herself. Terms of personal dignity are entirely constituted by social conditions, he writes. His work on humiliation, looking at recognition, respect and the rejection of rejection has also been important for my study. An understanding of dignity would imply a greater privileging of people's agency as it is a positive striving, as against studying the nature, types and extent of discrimination. Um, if we shift the focus to dignity, we record the experience of discrimination automatically, but as part of a larger positive articulation of resistance and an imagining of change. The next slide discusses the concept or idea of humanhood being an equal and full human. Um, there is a quote here, Sometimes I feel like scolding God. We should not have been born as Madiga, should not have been born as a woman. Being a dog is better. Uh, in, it is this struggle and pain to feel and be treated as a full and equal person that is reflected in the above quote. This is from the narrative of Lachmama, a woman who has spent more than 40 years working as a caste labourer attached to an upper caste household. The underlying theme in this expression is a sense of being treated as a lesser human and a questioning of this idea. This idea of humanhood or being an equal human, being a full human, forms the core behind dignity. Ambedkar explained caste as a system of graded inequality. The importance of identity in its very basic form, that of being an equal human, was articulated by Dr. Ambedkar. He argued that while it is true that the untouchables do not have large properties to protect, they do have their very person to protect. This idea of humanhood proves critical. It reflects the graded inequalities in social structures in terms of a grading of the human being itself as fully human, subhuman, lesser human or even animal. During the interviews, one of the findings was that I realized this idea, um, Ambedkar's conception of humanhood was coming alive in the field. This is how dignity and its realms were being expressed by the women. They used the phrases, now manushyar agilla or now manushyar agidivi or now ardha manushyar agidivi which means we have not become human yet or we have become human or we have only become half human. The, this is how they spoke of dignity, describing experiences and also bringing out components of life and conditions or spheres necessary to feel human, to feel dignity. Um, in the next slide, we look at the theoretical idea that the health services system is a part of the larger social system. There is enough public health literature that argues that the health services system reflects the larger social system in which it is located. 
exclusion, inequality hierarchies operating in the society get mirrored in the health institutions. It is the institutions of the state, including these health institutions, which are to secure the subjective freedom guaranteed by law. So this is of interest to us. How far do the health services uh, institutions embody dignity? As a concept and a normative principle, dignity may have relevance not just in addressing the what of public health planning, but also to reflect on the how. Here, dignity uh, would be related to the notion of responsiveness. A public health organization can be looked at as a human service organization, writes Hassan Field, where both the professional workers and care seekers co-produce outcomes. So how do people carrying different axes of inequality negotiate these institutions? Because to the recipients of uh, services, these institutions are expected to embody values of caring, commitment, trust and responsiveness. But Hassenfield uh, writes that they often evoke, uh, these institutions often evoke both hope and fear, care and victimization, dignity and abuse. Finally, in the subsequent slides, um, I'm looking at the last conceptual idea that um, I want to talk about in this presentation used for the research. And this is the concept of embodiment. With this idea, we're looking at uh, how our bodies are reflecting or accumulating the experience of inequalities. I have used the works of Krieger and Davy Smith, Shepherd Hughes and Locke, Nina Das, Gopal Guru, V. Gita, among others, to understand the ideas of embodiment. Shepherd Hughes and Locke talk of breaking the mind body duality. So, for example, they say that pain is considered either physical or mental and mind-body-society interactions lack a vocabulary. And this is what is of interest to me. Especially trying to understand, for example, something like humiliation, which involves both material uh, denial and direct physical impact and also works on the emotional level. Or, for example, what has chronic hunger meant for the body and mind as the entire focus of the life of um, Dalit women has often been around food. So how has this been changing over time, etc. So the, the mind-body-society interaction is something that um, conceptually one has been interested in. Um, on to the next slide. Das's work looks at how the individual body is the bearer of pain felt in the social body. And she also looks at the body as a site of conflict. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here I'm talking about the perspective or the Dalit feminist standpoint. This study uh, has engaged with adopting a Dalit feminist standpoint using the writings of Sharmila Rege. This standpoint, she writes, sees caste hierarchies and patriarchies as intrinsically linked. Historically, left-party-based women's organizations had collapsed caste into class and the autonomous women's movements had collapsed caste into sisterhood, both leaving Brahminism unchallenged. It is as an opposition to this perspective that a Dalit feminist perspective arose. Essentially, a feminist politics keeping women from the most marginalized communities at the center. For me, this perspective has been very important and also, um, as a public health student, I see that it very organically and fundamentally takes an intersectionality approach, trying to look at different, uh, trying to look at caste and gender as intrinsically linked. We look very briefly at the methodological framework and methods in the next couple of slides. The methodology for the primary field work rested within the qualitative research paradigm. The attempt was to unravel and understand the subjective experience um, of health. A social anthropological approach attempts to combine normative and interpretative approaches and is adopted for this study. The study gives primacy to people's perceptions, their life context and meanings. Uh, drawing from the work of Ritu Priya, we see that perception studies require a contextualized and historical analysis. The women's articulation and meanings of dignity are to be interpreted with a historical understanding of their lives and the political economy of the region. 
For this, it is methodologically very, very useful to look at the context of change and also to look for people's frames of reference in this context to trace the perceptions and understand meanings. Uh, in the next slides, we run through the methods. We have recorded life history and uh, narratives. Sharmila Reke writes that Dalit life narratives are in fact testimonials which contest the official forgetting of histories of caste oppression, struggles and resistance. Um, the life histories and narratives were followed up with in-depth interviews, uh, collected treatment narratives, uh, conducted focus group discussions as well. But I want to point out uh, here participant observation. This has been extremely important. Living with the women, participating in the labor processes, and just being with them and observing helped to understand the subtle ways in which caste and gender operate. Additionally, we've tried to also undertake a morbidity mapping exercise and also collected a lot of songs um, and because this is a huge part of uh, the life of Dalit women uh, in Raichur and um, as agricultural labourers and in every process, songs has been a very big part of the community and I'm trying to see how this is, you know, part of their uh, health and well-being. And now uh, we move to some of the findings and insights with uh, the next set of slides. Um, the spheres or components of dignity articulated by the women is given in this slide. This list, as you can see, is very comprehensive, covering food, work, land, etc. And is close to uh, a holistic understanding of well-being and the social determinants of health. It is important that we see that women from the Dalit, mostly landless, landless contexts, contexts, have identified aspects of dignity which bring together economic and social uh, realms. I will not be covering all of these areas of research and will just present uh, key findings from some of the domains uh, of dignity that have been identified by the women. In the next set of slides, we explore the theme of work identified as a space for the creation and denial of dignity. In the narratives of women, agricultural labor is a central theme and there are many, many layers and meanings attached to work and its linkages to health and well-being. We see that the relationship between health and dignity was mediated through the capacity to work. Having work meant having food for the family and this meant health and, feeling, and a feeling of being human. Ill health meant not being able to labor, not having food and this made them feel they are not fully human. It was sharp and clear. Duri beku unu beku, duri beku unu beku, we work, we eat. This was a line mentioned by every woman to explain um, the life cycle of work and food um, in, in, in their life. When asked about uh, their life, this was the first thing they would talk about. This was their life. Work, eat, work, eat. Uh, these were the most important components of dignity that emerged um, from their uh, narratives. Further in the next slide we see, work gave dignity but work also often made them feel they are not fully human. They described how hard they would labor sometimes just to be able to make ends meet and survive and this is when they would feel a sense of being indignity or a sense that they have not become human. Um, perceptions regarding work, health and well-being have to be seen located in the context of change that we talked about. As we see in the next slide, the reference frame that the women spoke of in this region was the coming of rice farming. The Tungabhadra Dam and Canal led to parts of Raichur getting irrigation. So a dry land area with its own caste labour relations suddenly saw the coming of rice. Rice farmers from Andhra Pradesh migrated here, uh, uh, large landlords, and this coming of rice saw a new labour system which led to a dent in the earlier feudal caste labour relations to an extent. Earlier we had the Vakkal Mane system where a family is attached to an upper caste household. Now for the first time 
cash as wages came in caste practices were not followed by the andhra landlords in the same way and so women recount this as a major change in their lives we discuss two insights now emerging from the narratives which at first sight seem like contradictions but when read with this context of change of the, the coming of rice and the lens of dignity they start to make sense the first is that women say how health has declined but well being has gone up over time here the key reason for health declining given by the women is the changes in food and diets rice consumption has led to a lot of dryland grains not being consumed anymore rice has meant a green revolution type high yielding variety high input agricultural mode of production uh, where the use of pesticides and chemical fertilizers has come in um but despite this perception of decline in health well being they say has improved here the reason is that overt forms of caste discrimination had declined um for the health factor they're talking about eating this poisonous rice with chemicals and fertilizers we're eating poison they say so that's why health has come down but well being has gone up because uh, a slow but distinct change in caste relations over the years propelled also by the dalit movement in the region has taken place therefore uh, dignity is the crucial aspect uh that makes people experience this rise in well-being despite a fall in health we now explore the second seeming contradiction that uh, they talk of the three types of labor relations are the vakkal mani system mentioned above where you are attached to an upper caste household the daily wage labor or dinner kooli uh, system and the contract labor um which began with rice the least preferred by um, all women is the vakkal mani system but between the other two systems women prefer the one which is actually far more back breaking and adverse in terms of health because of a greater sense of freedom and dignity that it offers so the contract uh, group uh, labor work uh, involves often day and night labor pushing of the body but this system offers a space comparatively free of caste relations and humiliations this will be uh, illustrated with the following quotes uh, the first in the next slide this quote describing uh, describes the humiliating incident of having been given water in old pesticide cans by the upper caste landlords uh, in the daily wage setup and the next quote which compares the sense of freedom in the next slide this compares the sense of freedom between the daily wage and contract systems in the contract group it is namma swatantra or our freedom say the women we can decide what to when to eat when to urinate when to have water and when to have tobacco further exploring the work and health uh, the area of work and health in the next slide we see that dalit women articulate a linkage between impacts of caste labor and extreme hard work um done in the past on their bodies today women express how pain is a result of hard labor and conditions of the past which was stored in the body and are showing up now for example um carrying heavy loads of dung and dirt on her head which is part of uh, caste based labor has led to uh, headaches and neck pain now Uh, you know this is from one of the narratives um morbidity mapping exercise is also bringing out this finding of chronic pain that is expressed throughout the year the enormity of this pain burden and the constant persistent and multiple nature of it is significant morbidity patterns express wider social conditions in fact a domain of uh, dignity connected to work uh, which the women spoke of is rest uh, especially after childbirth every woman interviewed remembers how many days weeks or months of rest they got after every delivery that she had had and having had to go back to the agricultural field in a few days or weeks meant a feeling of not being human 
In the next slides now, we briefly look at some of the findings related to interactions with the public health system. Uh, this quote given in this slide was made as a humor-filled comment, but one finds that it powerfully conveys important aspects of people's perceptions of public health institutions, perceptions of commercialization, lack of a space to dialogue, and a definite power equation akin to existing social hierarchies is highlighted. There is a clear perception of differential treatment, uh, as we see in the next slide, across economic and social groups. It is interesting to note that earlier experiences of caste-based overt discrimination in health services, in the PHC, um, such memories do exist as collective memories and people do recount these. However, there is an acknowledgement of decline and change in this uh, caste differentiation and a shift to now a feeling or a greater sense of being marked as poor or caste-based differentials in the health institutions. Um, and it's important to uh, see that there is also um, women observe differences in language used across caste and class by the health uh, providers, um, attention and time given, there are differences in this and a sense that the quality of care given is different. Across villages and across gender, one finds that everybody felt money was prime, um, money was in working in the government setup as well. The health situation of Dalit women in Raichur continues to be precarious, and getting health care for these women who subsist on agricultural labour is a struggle. They experience of constant vulnerability, in terms of health and access to care, despite um, economic progress. The examples of people who have to bring their family member or a child back, knowing that treatment exists but they cannot afford it anymore, are a plenty. And this, to bring someone home because of poverty, uh, this is something that women spoke of as a great sense of indignity. Um, at a larger level, the experience of this dual health system or a health system which is not universal. So the women talk of how there is the public health services for the poor and the private is for the rich. This duality, this itself is uh, felt as a great indignity. Um, so, so in a sense, they are arguing for a universal uh, health service. Also, they see tangible and intangible elements um, within the public health services as interacting together to produce dignity or indignity. Uh, dignity was not only about proper speech and language, um, but also not having medicines, not having facilities was an indignity. The tangible elements were as important. In the final slide uh, dealing with findings, I just want to share some initial thoughts and flag some ideas which I'm still working on, emerging from the ongoing analysis, looking at anxieties. Uh, how do emotions of humiliation, fear, grief, rage, exhaustion, loss and sadness get stored, translated and expressed through the body-mind? Um, one of the spaces that uh, the women's narratives highlighted was the space of work and the agricultural field itself uh, being a site for healing of both physical and mental pain uh, and anxieties. So women talk of a sense of ullasa, khushi, or exhilaration, joy. Uh, they talk of laya, or rhythm, associated with work. They speak of how um, agricultural labor as a collective process involves companionships, friendships between women, jokes, uh, and a lot of singing. So this is one area that I'm looking at, how work and anxieties, what are the perceptions on that. And uh, interestingly, women have spoken earlier clearly about health, how health has declined, but well-being has gone up. But now over time, again, there seems to be another subtle shift or decline in well-being, as many, many of them are speaking of this sense of uneasiness and anxiety a fear in the pit of one's stomach and what they call chinti and there is a web of reasons possible 
behind this which I'm still trying to look at and I just want to mention one or two and one is to do with aspirations and anxieties. Um, women have spent, many of the women have spent their entire lives trying to uh, imagine a better life for their children and so the hard labor, starvation, everything that they have gone through, they have done with this goal to get their child educated and many children have managed but this is now finally reaching a roadblock because ultimately caste is a caste and class is operating in getting those uh, life opportunities to getting access to resources to use that education um, and women talk of how caste is expressing itself in different forms they say that it's gone inside it's gone underground it's inside one's stomach it's inside the stomach of the upper castes so while overt forms of untouchability may have uh, declined it still exists exists in terms of access to life chances resources and dignity in fact even instances of um, this direct uh, you know um, caste based um, untouchability and violence is rearing its head on and off you do find those instances as well there are um, cases of social boycott so and in the larger uh, indian picture this is increasing much more but there is still a sense that it's gone inside you, you don't directly talk about untouchability existing but the, it's taking different forms and this is linked to a lot of the anxieties that women are expressing I'd like to sum up in the last slide. Through this presentation, uh, I attempted to make a case for a greater need to address caste within public health discourse and its intersectionality with gender and class. Continuities in caste and newer forms have to be examined in the context of health and well-being. The lens of dignity allows for this intersectionality. It allows for, to bring together the material and social realms uh, the idea of is, uh, dignity that the women, Dalit women articulated was not some esoteric concept. They were bringing together the economic and the social. They were talking about resources and recognition. They were talking about measuring a feeling of being human. And they were talking about respect and freedom. Finally, using the lens of dignity, we have a tool to critically look at health service institutions and examine the culture of the institutions or programs and responsiveness within public health. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much and also apologize that maybe the presentation was a bit disjoint because I tried to touch on a lot of um, active um, aspects of the research and I thank you all once again.